We're here at RSA Conference. It's been a great week, but we've got a great day ahead of you. Here, you're watching Tech Strong Gang. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this special episode of Tech Strong Gang. We actually recorded this on Thursday of last week at our uh, Broadcast Alley studios here where we've been all week here for RSA conference. This is probably, I guess, the largest RSA conference or one of the largest ever. It's certainly been a memorable one. Some people are saying it's RSAI, but it's mm. nevertheless RSA. I've got a great panel here for we're going to we're going to obviously talk about RSA, but we've got other things to talk about. Let me introduce you to our panel. First of all, joining us far left, he's not in Denver. Well, <laughs> Hi. Actually, I don't know if he's high or not, but <laughs> he's here in San Francisco. It's our CTO principal uh, research analyst for Tech Strong Research, Mitch Ashley. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome. Good to be here. Next to us. He's not on his boat either. He's here wow. in person. I, I didn't recognize him without the boat on No, him. you didn't recognize him without the boat. <laughs> Our resident cyber expert, Chris Blass. Chris, well, welcome. Be Joining us for the first time. He's a, he's a virgin for Tech Strong Gang, like a virgin <laughs> for the very first time. <laughs> um, <laughs> my friend, Mark Miller. Hey, Mark, welcome. Hey, good, thank you. And, of course, you. I'm Alan Schimmel. So, look, it's obvious we're here at RSA. I guess we should start by... Talking about an RSA wrap-up. Guys, impressions? I mean, this is my 22nd, 22nd or 23rd RSA. I think one of the things that is noticeable this year is the comeback after COVID. Mm -hmm. And I know it's been a couple of years, but it's reached its momentum again. We're at 30 to 40,000 people. Oh, no, we're over. I heard 46 oh, 40. or something. Oh, that's yeah, that. I heard yeah, that's the last thing, right? So, and, and literally everybody is here. I can't walk a half a block yeah. without running into somebody. Oh, the first day, it's like I couldn't get to the Starbucks without six hilos and hugs. <laughs> yeah, and hugs are back. Hugs are back. That's really the back. sign that's that That's a great point. Yeah. Last year, we had 40,000 people, if you remember, but people were a little hesitant right. to hug, right? right? You, you know, you give them one of those. This year, hugs are definitely the Heisman. back. Yeah, the highs we tried to hug. <laughs> but... Um, I did, I did see some people with masks, and, and God bless them. You know, you don't know if people are sensitive, right? Or, or uh, maybe, or well, maybe sick themselves and trying not to friends, but like our friends. It's also the RSA of the stigma. police dog. We see more, yes, police dog security. security. General, we have high. airport security. Here. Airport yes. yeah. security. Uh, yeah. Well, part of that may be look the RSA and, and give Britta and, and Linda and, and the team a, a big shout out. They brought in some amazing speakers. Oh. We had Anthony Blinken, who's sec obviously Secretary of State. Uh, May August, the, the DHS Secretary was here. Uh, Jason uh, Sudeikis. Jason Sudeikis was here. Uh, Alicia, Alicia Keys. Keys is closing yeah. out today. And those are the non-security <laughs> people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now well, let's get to right? the security. <laughs> but you, you're right. It, for me and all of us, Chris, Mitchell, Mark, we, we spend our world at conferences to a large degree. For me, this is still the home conference, right? Yeah. This is where my people are. This is where I come to see people I haven't seen in a year. I would come here even if I wasn't doing this or speaking or doing anything. It, this is where it's still where the security industry comes to meet. Well, and think about the, uh, sorry, Chris, think about the uh, Security Bloggers Network now. Security yeah, Creators Creators Creators. we'll, we'll talk Network. about that. We were all at uh, just a phenomenal event last night. One of the best night. we've ever had at it the was. Conga Room. And new people, uh, you know, new age groups, you know, we're expanding. the. the that, that was the point I was going to get oh, to. Oh, good. Because you're right, you know, the, part of it is the, the pandemic gave us this little pause. And it's been long enough now, it's five years. And one of the things I've noticed in this, this year is a generational augmentation yeah. right there's a lot of young folks mm. five years is a long time right there's a lot of yeah. 27 year olds who were 22 before this or right. 27 or 32 and at the at the the creators get together last night you know our first conversation was with some some young writers who are coming into this i think that's a it's a very healthy sign you know we're you know, my almost randy this yeah. whole industry is very immature very young for all the time we spend in it it's not a long time 
I think we're starting to see the beginning of the next phase. It's That's interesting. Smart. We saw that at the Tonga Room last night. Yeah, it's 50 50 parody, male to female, which was, if, well, was that amazing. Was, that was back then. amazing. Oh, no. Yeah. Right. Oh, now we need some more diversity, people of color. That, that yes. I think we need right. to continue to work on. The thing, though, as we look around here, it's. Uh, are we seeing more women? Are we seeing more younger people? I said, yeah, that's cool. That's very cool. But as an industry, we need to start thinking, and it's almost a buzzword in the sense, we have to encourage that. You have to no, flirt, encourage the diversity. Absolutely. Let me, you know, I, I, I kicked it off by saying some people were calling this year's event RSAI. AI is everywhere. Don't get um, me started on that. Okay. <laughs> no, I, uh, uh, the engines are already RPM'd up. You know, but look, quite frankly, <laughs> physician, heal thyself. You put on an event Monday that was DevSecOps <laughs> and AI. It's <laughs> already in an AI world. I bought the real practitioner. I bought the CISOs from the major companies. Oh, you did the real AI people. These people are not the real AI you know, when you Is that what you're trying to I sell? I call bullshit on it. Yeah. All right. You're calling bullshit <laughs> on it. Go ahead. Well, how many people are, you know, there were talks. I mean, I think you stood up at one of the talks and, you know, sort of get a, a version of calling bullshit of, yeah. that's not an AI framework you're talking about. That's a framework we've used that you for put years. AI on. Slap right. AI. So there's a lot of slapping AI on. No, the there, there is a lot of slapping AI. But there's yeah, also good standing AI. Standing up in front of 500 people talking like this framework is new and all you've done is cut and paste the AI on the top of the, the different bo boxes in it. Well, I mean, to your point, you know, of course, I've been focusing on supply chain the last five years, right? And I, again, we're talking about the, the length of our time at, at this particular conference in this, in this industry. And one of the things I've found in any sort of hype cycle, there's three years. There's the one year, so we SPOM yes. two years ago. You say, SPOM, what? SPOM, what? Now, oh, yeah. Then there's the year everybody is on the, you know, we're sort of there with AI, as you guys saying, this year. And then there's this year, you know, which sort of passed. And the thing I take away from this is walking down the street, the first person I turn around and meet in the in the badge line software bill materials oh yeah i went to the ESET uh, uh corporate uh, event yesterday and my question was have you built this into your offerings yet and the short answer is no but they're about to yeah, sit down with these same folks next year at the same conference and i'll say yes and yeah that that conversation with a couple other folks showed that so i think on the ai topic we're in this year where everybody's talking about it and you're right there's probably a lot of junk but it's high school sex. Yes, but it'll yeah. That's right. By well, next year, we're starting to get married. Yeah, Mark, okay. again, right? so. <laughs> yo, yo, yo. You know, I so. But look, it, there's always a kernel of truth in there, and and I don't want to throw out the AI babies with the bathwater. Right. There is some fundamentally, you know, earth-shattering, industry-changing innovations that are, we're on the cusp of with AI, as well as, unfortunately, probably, some really bad things that bad people are going to do using AI. Mm -hmm. But the adversary I, isn't what's being talked about here a lot, which surprises uh, me at a company exactly. like this. Oh, well, there's only so much you can do about them, right? You know, at the end of the day, unless you're going to be in offense, and that's a nation-state activity, we're in defense. And this is where, you know, this whole event and this whole Internet thing proves this open source, freedom of speech, democracy, capitalism sort of model, right? Where world is built better things. The conditions are what they are. If there's going to be bad disinformation actors, AI actors, that may be something we deal with. On our side, we'll just build systems that, you know, work anyways. You know, a lot of the, some of the conversations evolved too around AI, talking about domain specific or training, you know, for uh, specific kind of problems. Like we talked about code security the other day at our conference. The other shift that I'm seeing is it isn't just co-pilots. Like, how many damn co-pilots do we need, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm going to have to add extra seats to the bus just to add, have some place for all the co-pilots to sit. People are starting to work on putting AI into workflows or into how teams work or how it can affect security processes, not just tell me what's happening in a better English queryable way, natural language. The thing that I've seen here, which is annoying to a point, is a lot of sessions saying you should be doing this, mm. but are you doing it yet? No, but that's what you should be doing. Agree. We're at the should stage. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> we should. Let's move on from AI for yeah. a minute because we're going to wrap this block up. Um, software supply chain security, you mentioned it in the context of SBOMs. 
I'll, I'll put forth the proposition that there's more to software supply chain security than s bombs. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, it, yeah. and it's one of the big themes here this year. What AppSec is year? too, with, with yeah. software supply but chain. But, you know, I, I did a panel yesterday on, on DevSecOps Next coming out of your research report. And one of the points I made is that DevSecOps does not equal AppSec. There's more to AppSec. Right. The DevSecOps. There's more to DevSecOps than purely AppSec. But AppSec is still absolutely ascending. But here's another thing. Hardware's back. It is. We talked really about that. You Mark and I point. spoke about it at breakfast today, right? Uh, uh, the NVIDIA revolution, if you want to call it, for GPUs and so forth. Now we're starting to talk about hardware again. We're talking about what does that mean in context of serverless? And, you know, VMware is part of Broadcom now. What's a hardware company know from VMware? Well, we're going to see. I think hardware security, which was dead. Remember, yeah. Intel was yeah. building oh. it into the... It's all abstracted you know. away. We don't need right. to worry about it's, it anymore. I think that's back. I am, not only am I excited about a new generation of security people, and I find it ironic that we got four old white guys here talking yeah, about sorry it. Sorry about that. I couldn't get anyone else <laughs> in <laughs> here. Um, but not only do we have a new generation of, of practitioners coming in, we, we are looking, we're lighting up the full spectrum of security. Yes, there's AI. Yes, there's DevSecOps and AppSec and software supply chain, but endpoint security, cloud security, infrastructure. Binary security. security. Binary, Binary composition analysis. analysis. Well, Ooh, we'd be yeah, talking. This is the Dirk Genley era, right? Yeah. You know, for all you Douglas Adams fans out there, everything's connected. <laughs> yeah. And no. we're serving, you, know, you, you start this with s not being all about you know, everything there is to know about supply chain. And I see this as sort of the third matching pattern. The first one was adoption of the internet at all. Mm -hmm. Firewalls, you know, right. early, early 1990s. The second one was threat intelligence where it asks the same sort of questions. How about we have open networks where you openly communicate, no, no, kid, you don't understand, the internet. How about we have threat intelligence so we share our threats and risk and vulnerability, oh, no, no, kid, you don't understand. We do that now. If you're not doing it, you're not in business. So right. now it's about inventories, you know, supply chain. You know, SBOM is just an attestation about contents. Um, oh, you're not going to share those? Yes, you are. In fact, you're going to share everything in the right ways. And I think that's the the definition of this next era and we'll use ai we'll use a lot of things we're talking about to follow the path that the internet put us on open systems not so open your brain falls out you know with standards and limits and and sharing appropriately but we're gonna put all these things together and just keep going the same direction we've been going it's not about closed systems it's not about the old way of doing things you know s bomb has come up here a lot in the last five minutes I saw Alan Friedman holding court in the middle of the hallway, <laughs> surrounded. Alan's time has come, right? Oh, yeah, he's absolutely. Been, he's spent a lot of time getting yeah, He has. Well, yeah, he's done missionary it. work. Right. Yep. Anyway. See, see, one of the things I want to mention before we leave this is a lot of, a lot of discussion about graphs, work, or work group, collaboration, people graphs, tying people in, all this data, how you connect it together. It, is, it just isn't just having a common set of objects and definitions of it. It's being able to say, here's an event that happened. Here's the other things that happened with it. Here's what other people were doing, end users, security engineers, operations people. It's all this activity that's happening across people, technology, services, software, security, et cetera, and connecting them together. You heard it from Microsoft at our DevSecOps event. Um, heard it last week from Atlassian talking about how people work. So I think people are recognizing it's not just putting data, co-locating data, having a, a common or similar kind of object model or definition, but you got to add meaning to it more than just correlating information. And that's an encouraging sign because it's one thing to share it, but it's another thing to know what's really happening once you've shared it, right? Right. Like you said an important word there, you know, people, right? It, you know, if everybody out there, if you get a chance, you know, to come to the, the, the family dinner, the tech strongholds, uh -huh. you know, it's about people and communities. And as we're discussing at that, that dinner, and on this show, generationally, the generational shift, our kids, you know, our grandkids in some cases, are growing up in a different world. And the, the issues of feelings and so forth have been debated a lot sociologically, but we get down to business dynamics, you know, and it's, we're building communities of people. You know, what happens when we're not all engineers turning wrenches? Do we all fade in the background? No, we're building systems for humans. 
And I think this next generation coming up is better suited than we are. The AI Build native and generation and is coming up right now, being right. born and being born Absolutely. as AI. Absolutely. Hey, I'm going to pull the plug on this block. We've got a lot more to talk about on TechStrong Gang, but I'm going to end it with this. If you didn't make this year's RSA, next year it's April 28th to May 1st. I'm reading it off the banner behind me. Try to get out here for yourselves and see it. Hopefully, God willing, we'll all be here and we'll be here at TechStrong. We're going to take a break on TechStrong Gang. We'll be right back. Hey everyone, we're back here on TechStrong TV. Uh, we're, we are at RSA conference doing a special edition of TechStrong Gang, so this was recorded last week. One of the issues I wanted to talk about is there's been a lot lately around open source. Uh, and, you know, it seems like the, the bloom is off the rose a little bit around open source. Companies are changing licenses to take their products out of open source. We're seeing a ton of open source security vulnerabilities. This, uh, what was it, YZ or XZ thing out of Microsoft yeah. that they discovered where kind of deep sleeper cells are inserting malware into open source. Um, open source has had a bit of a trust problem building in the last couple of years, actually. Just the overall security in general, of, of as a, from a supply chain, right. you know, your favorite Supply topic. chains and SBOMs as it relates to cloud. I want to introduce you. We yes. brought in a new person. This isn't Mark Miller, if you can't <laughs> figure that out. It's our friend Sharon Fitz Fitzpatrick. Sharon is with Sysdig. She is sort of a, uh, well, Sharon's a security extraordinarily extraordinary person. I enjoy talking to her. I think you'll enjoy talking to her. If she's not talking about security, she's talking about Nittany Lions football. Yes. So, yeah. there you go. From a gator. We well, I'm are. Gator. <laughs> Head state. Oh, oh, hey, no, let's not do the I'm, football. I'm thing. doing him early because he's coming to a game with me yes, at some I point. Have. So. I can't believe you did say like Steelers, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, this is college football. College, I know. Different. It's anyway, still, though, still pens enough football. Let's get back to open source. Oh, I'll stick with football. <laughs> you, have, you had to bring it up. I had to. <laughs> but, Mitchell, why don't you kick us off with open source? You know, it, it, it's it's one of those, everybody kind of had the, um, kind of the bloom is off the roads. Everybody had the opt optimistic, this is a good thing, it's good for everybody. Um, it, it underpins, you know, large percentages of the code that we deploy, the software that we deploy. And I think enough things have happened now, you know, we can all point to solar winds or whatever individual event, but enough things have started to happen about us, and we're paying attention to supply chain security. Like, what is the security of the open source that we're using in our products, as well as in our, our software, in our IT organizations, in our infrastructure? I don't think it's get rid of it, throw the baby out with the bathwater, to use that analogy again. But it is, how do we secure it? How do we have some provenance about where it came from that we know? Whether it's somebody contributing to the code or just the code itself. Sharon, you know, Sysdig, look, you guys do container security, cloud security. Yep. Just last week, there was this thing in Docker Hub. I don't know if you saw where some of the images within Docker Hub itself Ooh. were, were, were mal contained malware and phishing and, and stuff like that. What do you, you know, it, and I realize you're not necessarily on the science side there, but talk a little bit about Swistig. What are you guys seeing, doing? Well, I mean, we've been really proud of the open source products that we've done. We just had Falco graduate from CNCF. Right, right. Which is a huge It's a huge, huge deal. deal. And, you know, Loris, our founder, also founded, you know, Wireshark. So he's very much committed to open source. And our open source very much considers security at the, the hub of it. So we've not had the experience that many of folks in the industry have had. But we do really look at the threat reports. We have a whole threat research team and the threat intelligence is what we use to learn and make our product better. And so, you know, we found RubyCarp and Scarlet Teal and all the stuff that's out there. So, Seems you know. like you're coming from a place of security and open source or uh, right. either way you look at it. 
where not every project is like that. That's true, yeah. And I think we also are very cognizant of time. Mm. So we kind of say, you know, five seconds to hit us, five seconds to detect, and five seconds to respond. And that five by five kind of benchmark methodology is really important when you consider time and malware and everything else threats hit in an instant and you have to respond. You know, you mentioned solar winds. Well, now think of the fact that you've got the SEC compliance laws coming out and everything that came out in December and having to do it in 96 hours. And how do you do that? Because you're now legally responsible for providing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I I think open source is a lot like free speech, right? And I think we're only a couple decades into this whole internet and open source thing anyways, which on, you know, the scale of most systems is really, really young. And I think as expected, we go through this sort of adolescent wearing a black beret and smoking Galois cigarettes and like, you know, know, going to interpretive dance. Tokyo uh, was old. (laughs) <laughs> we are in California. And, yes. But at some point, you had to grow up a little bit, right? And does that mean you stop doing that entirely? You know, so early open source, early free speech. You know, free speech means that everybody gets to say everything everywhere the same as everybody else. So we can all shout fire in crowded theaters. Oh, wait, there's, there's an exception to this. That doesn't mean you don't have free speech. So, and, and it's, it's just, you know, saying and implying, we don't have any of this without open source. Now, does that mean that there is no limit, no controls, and no visibility? No, that's kind of stupid, too. Right. Or just getting to this maturity level where we're starting to be able to put things together as necessary for the next level. But the, if the alternative is entirely closed systems, like that, that's not even on the table. But I think you have to be open because you right. have to right. have the ability to remix, reuse, reprotect, and bring in something where maybe you're vulnerable and you have a partner or another open source product that together you're better than one. And I think that's been the beauty of open source because it's really how you can rethink and redefine what security is or what open source is. I actually wrote a book about this um, for the Eula Foundation, but it was more tied to education called Open Textbook. So it was really about remixing, reusing, and redistributing content in a different way so you could learn more in a different time. Interesting. So let me, let me make the case that this is all, all of the open source security issues actually have been a good thing. I'm not saying I wish they happened, but Need think about happen. well, they drive evolution. We're now, well, we're, but we're now talking about, you know, DevSecOps is the entire life cycle of creating software as well as the technology that we do it on, right? That's tool chains underlying because that's how solar winds happened, right? So we're paying attention to, to software supply chain, I think, largely because of the issues found, security issues found in open source. If that wouldn't happen, we'd be still kind of living along, happy, you know, drunk and happy, and whatever. Bad, stupid, bad, and stupid, yeah. and happy, right? You know, yeah. was it uh, the animal house? That, <laughs> that, that seems my whole you know, focus on curves, right? Because it's not that no one ever thought of software inventory before, but now it's time. And we keep going through these you know, periods. And again, because we are talking about earlier, we're old enough and we've seen this multiple times. Right. And it's easy to say, well, I thought of that 30 years ago. It's like, yeah, but it wasn't that time. Yeah. Right. It's Sometimes time. it's time. And, and you're right. You know, moving, as you guys know, I, I build sail, silly boats and sail them into storms to see what happens. And that's what we're sort of doing. You know, it's like, we can actually do this, build businesses and countries. Sail it forward, it'll crash a little bit and we'll rebuild it. And that's... A very old I, system. It's threat actors, too. I think that yes. threat actors have really redefined mm. kind of how we secure open source. Mm-hmm. And they always seem to find the vulnerabilities, which is why we're hearing about constant invasions and malware and ransomware and everything else. Every time you turn around, I'm getting a letter from a you know, healthcare provider or a credit card company that they've been hacked. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's really the threat actors have gotten very sophisticated. I, I think open source has been a victim of its own success. Good point. Right. Back in the 90s, early 2000s, a Mac was invulnerable, right? Those Windows machines, terrible security. No, Mac security is, you know, impenetrable. Well, it's because it was only 5% of the market and no one gave a crap. Right. Hey. When Mac got to 20%, 25%, whatever it is of the market, all of a sudden they became, they had a target on their back. And people said, hey, we should start hacking Macs. And, and God darn it, they did. All of a sudden we started seeing Mac attacks. Now, 
Was it as bad as a window machines running XP? No, probably not. But as we sit here today, are Macs particularly more secure than today's Windows? I, I, whether you're a fanboy or not, you, you can go back and forth, but there's not a big difference because Macs are a target. When open source wasn't in 98% of the Fortune 500, when open source didn't make up 80% or more of the components within every application, no one gave a hoot. But now they do. So it, it's, a, it's a victim of its own success, and it's to be expected. It's kind of, why do they keep robbing banks? Well, that's where the money is. Exactly. That's exactly that, right? <laughs> that's exactly yeah. it. I mean, hackers are doing the same thing. I found it really interesting that there's a group of white hat hackers that are hired by companies who have open source or have their own code to break it. And so red team, blue team yeah. stuff. There's yeah, been it's going great. on. Yeah. But, and we're part of we're you know we the defenders and the, the security people are the other part of that ecosystem. As we close off certain windows that are nutrient rich, that I mean, if you're a bad guy, that'll take all your time to exploit. Now we close it off, and they turn around, and they find something else we missed. The easy and we shouldn't okay. be shocked. Yeah, Lower hanging exactly. fruit, right? You want yeah. to know where you're going to fail before you go to market, right? <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. Wow. Hey. This is a great, uh, a great talk. Sorry, thank you for coming her. by. What a oh, serendipitous, right? Yeah. Ad hoc, as they say. Go Nittany Lions. I will Woo. see you soon. Uh, Sistig, check them out. Sharon does a lot of stuff that you should check her out as well. Sharon Fitzpatrick. We're going to take a break on Tech Strong Gang. We'll be back. Everyone, uh, welcome back to Textron Gang. We're here for our third segment at RSAC. We're recording this the prior week, so coming uh, to you on Monday. We wanted to touch back into the AI subject, but not about the technology, about the people side of that. I mean, you think about the 46,000 people that are here, all wanting to understand security, AI, how that's all going to be part of our world. but. You know, there's a lot of fear in the market about what does it mean for people? You know, pe there's a lot of right. espousing of, you know, this is going to replace all these jobs, whatever it might be. I think we've all seen instances of that of our time, whether it's robotics or automation or, you know, it increases productivity. Maybe it changes jobs. It might eliminate some, but give great new opportunities. Um, or do, is it going to take over for all of us and we don't have to do the work we're doing? It's interesting. Some people use the buggy whip analogy it's like mm. the men but it it's not that this time because everybody is now aware of where this thing is going the real fear is where do i as a person fit into this transition mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of fear mongering in the mass media about oh people are going to lose their jobs they're not going to be anything to do uh i would argue that that's not what's happening chris I agree. You know, in, in 1987, when Don and I got married, you know, we had to put your occupation on there. So I mm -hmm. pull this up sometimes and I'm a forklift driver and Don is a word processor, which is an app now. But there were whole floors of people who paid their bills and so forth by being a word processor. So I think the buggy whip analogy is true or not. But, you know, it's, I think, you know, I feel like a bit of a hippie saying this, but I think we move more and more to human related jobs. You know, that, you know, we can make a robot or make code that'll pound this wrench into that nail or write this line, but we're doing it for people, right? And that's really what it's all about. And so I think creativity in the arts, I think we see this in the generation coming up today. And we've touched on this some of our, in our tech business talk here, companies are made of people. You know, why are we here to pay our bills and, and but also to have a good day, right? So I think, I think, you know, my, my Pollyanna optimism is showing 
But I think it's true. I think in 10, 20 years we look back, we'll find out that we worked in sort of a brutalistic, you know, corporate business environment all of our lives, just bending more towards what people actually want to do, which is not necessarily pound coat all day. I don't disagree. I, you know, so do you tell your children to be a plumber or an electrician? If they want to, you know. <laughs> you know, think back to the Mercury day, you have Mercury rocket days, computer was a person and a two-year word processor. So some of those things become, those jobs become functions of what we do, not just job titles. So maybe security engineer, I don't know, that'll become a piece of software, but what we do, our jobs change, right? Because we're now, we have access to things we didn't have. I mean, we have talked about the AI generation growing up, AI natives. I think the same thing is true. In 10 years, we're going to be talking about security, probably still, you know, buffer overflow issues and cross-site scripting, but we'll be talking about a whole new set. I mean, the OWASP top yeah. 10 isn't going to change? I think that will be around <laughs> for a while, well, at least if history's any indication. Um, but there'll be... Well, the way we work is going to change. It's going to be different. The, the issue, you don't agree. You, no, no, I oh, do agree. I okay. think, but I don't think this is unique to AI. Mm, I right, think this is right. this is the story of every generation. You, you're looking at someone who went to college as a political science history major, went to law school with a JD, and then got into the internet designing websites and hosting them, and then got into infrastructure and then security. And here I am talking about cybersecurity on internet TV at an event in San Francisco. <laughs> Make if, that prediction. If you would have gone back to, to my 20-year-old me and said, is that what you're going to do at this age? I would have said, hell no. What are you talking? I don't even know what that internet thing is, and I never had a computer. I have an Atari. But so say, you know, fast forward that. Who knows what the jobs of tomorrow are? I think that's a good point because... The fear is, I don't see myself in the future. Mm. What because, I'm doing today in yeah. the future, even. Right. That people are looking, where's my next pathway? And I'm hearing all this stuff about AI and AI replacing me. I don't think that's in the ball game. The thing is, find your path and it'll be there. Yeah, it's not the next offshoring outsourcing model right yes it's going to do things that we might do ourselves today but you know it's it isn't sentient yet <laughs> it isn't it doesn't understand the space any better matter of fact doesn't even know what it's producing for gen ai it doesn't know what the meaning of that it, even of it is maybe it will someday but you know i think we're still creators we're still going to create well, what the next thing is that follows after ai let me go a little john belushi on you okay food fight no, not no, not that Jello. one. Oh, not that one. <laughs> no, but people in Star Trek don't worry about this stuff, right? <laughs> right. They just right. do whatever makes them happy and what they want to pursue. They don't have to worry about money and and all of these things. But no, not us. We got to worry about and jobs. As long as they don't have a red shirt on and they're right. Well, yeah, they, they red. have a small, a very <laughs> low lifespan with the red shirt. But the, the fact of the matter is. All of these innovations, and AI happens to be today's whipping boy, all of these innovations generally wind up allowing us to pursue our dreams, to pursue our, not, not just livelihoods. No one, I mean, it's a death sentence to go to a job you hate every day yeah. or a profession you hate every day. And when you can leverage technology, whether it be AI or the internet or, or whatever it's next, to allow you to do something that gives you joy, you know, no all kidding aside about the Star Trek, that gives you joy and fulfillment and makes you feel like you're contributing and doing something meaningful, it's a good thing. And I think that's how we have to look at AI. How does this make us joyful, meaningful, and con contributing? And I think AI gives us a lot of possibilities there. So, you know, call me half glass, half full guy, but that's where I am on this. The next generation is going to be raised with this. This yeah. isn't even going to be an issue. Absolutely. It's not even a debate. I mean, I, I've always taken, when I can, I try to take the approach of, instead of done to me, done, you know, let me be part of this, right? And so it's a, it's a participation sport. Let me, let me try it. Let me use AI. You know, maybe somebody who's never written a line of code could use AI to, like, create a little something. Oh, wow, that's really cool. Maybe I could write 
I'm not a writer, but I could get some help from doing that. Maybe it's going to empower the next person that writes. Maybe the next David Brin will be a writer because AI helped them get started. You build some confidence Agreed. by doing it. Agreed. I, I was, I'm such an optimist anyway. You know, I, I just basically agree with everything you guys are saying, but I see AI as a time to transparency accelerator. You know, so many things don't get to happen because we just don't have time. And I think mm -hmm. about it in the security context all the bloody time, but it's in, just in life. You know, it's, it's it, well, I would, I'd really like to bring you joy to do this, but I can't because it'll take seven minutes when I've got a couple seconds or it'll take seven days or seven years. And we're collapsing a lot of that, you know, to create the opportunities for people to do things, which include, you know, business, work, building things. People like doing things and, and we're going to do it forever. Now we'll just be able to do a wider range of them that we never crossed our mind because we didn't have the time. We didn't have the time. Speaking of time, we're about out of it here. <laughs> I was going to say. Hey, this is going to wrap up our special Tech Strong Gang episode from RSA. We hope you've enjoyed it. We've got a full Tech Strong TV schedule following this, so stay tuned for that. We'll be back tomorrow with a fresh Tech Strong Gang back at our studios in Boca. Until then, on behalf of Mitchell Ashley, Chris Blass, <laughs> Mark Miller, Alan Schimmel, enjoy. We're out. I'm Bonnie Schneider, sustainability contributor to the TechStrong Group. I'm excited to introduce you to a groundbreaking new initiative from TechStrong Research, the Sustainability Pulse Meter. The Pulse Meter offers valuable insights into how environmental responsibility factors into tech purchasing decisions for key players in the industry. Position your company as a leader in the industry and differentiate from your competitors with the Sustainability Pulse Meter, offered exclusively from TechStrong Research.